Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start with a brief description of my background. I've been working in the biological sciences for over 10 years now, most recently in neuroscience working with rodents. And I'm interested in the role of the body in the transfer of social information. So what I mean by this is what does the movement of an individual of the same species tell us about our environment and what are the mechanisms that have evolved to allow us to understand this? And this coincides nicely with another great love of mine, something that I've worked and studied for a number of years, which is physical theater. Here's a photo of some of my students working with masks that we work with. And here, as you can imagine, the role of the body becomes much more pronounced. We have to transmit social information about our environment, which we can now call the stage, to individuals of the same species, which we can now call the audience. I'm interested in how physical theater hijacks and develops the mechanisms that have evolved for the transfer of social information and applies that to the stage. And today, I'd like to talk about, um, drawing from my experience of working professionally in both fields, I'd like to talk about how I think art both contributes to science and to the generation of new forms of knowledge. So this is Semmer Zeki. Semmer Zeki is often considered the, the father of neuroesthetics. Neuroesthetics being the study of the neural basis of beauty perception in art. Semmer Zeki argues that in a way, all artists are neuroscientists because they investigate the properties of the brain and reveal its capabilities. In other words, art can not only give us insights into the soul, but also into the functioning of the brain. For example, the painter Pete Mondrian claimed he was searching for the constant elements of all forms and used thick, bold, black lines and primary colors in many of his paintings. 30 years later, neuroscientists would discover orientation cells in the V1 of the visual cortex. This is a fundamental sensory area that actively selects for straight lines, such as the ones that Mondrian used in his paintings. Through intuition, through experience, through trial and error, one could argue that Mondrian exploited a fundamental aspect of how we see the world, long before science had discovered it. Of course, another fundamental aspect of how we see the world, besides shapes such as lines, is movement. And kinetic artists like Alexander Calder create fascinating examples of the brain's motion perception circuitry, de-emphasizing color and form long before the V5, the visual motion center, was chartered and found to process movement in a similar way. One could argue that these artists are exploring the same questions, they're just using different techniques. Moving on to examples where art perhaps has contributed more directly, these sculptures are called Tenzengrady sculptures. Tenzengrady sculptures are, are called this because the relationship between the tensional and compressional components give the piece its structure. And this, these were created by an artist called Kenneth Snelson, and this concept was later used and applied to model protein structures in the biological sciences. And art has even created new medical devices. Curiosity about the larynx and how the vocal cords work while singing led the musician Manuel Garcia to create the first laryngoscope, now used, of course, extensively by the medical community. So art has intuited discoveries and provided techniques that have been beneficial to science. But another way in which I think that art is beneficial to science, which is often overlooked because it's quite subtle, is through the subjective experience of art by the scientists themselves. The subjective experience of art by the scientists themselves. So to start this argument, I'd like to introduce a quote by Ramon y Cajal. Ramon y Cajal is often considered the father of modern neuroscience. He's a Nobel Prize laureate, and he was a painter and artist himself. When asked what he searched for in a potential science student, he said he looked for those who, being endowed with an abundance of restless imagination, spend their energy in the pursuit of literature, art, philosophy, and all the recreations of the mind and body. To him who observes them from afar, it appears as though they are scattering and dissipating their energies, while in reality they are channeling and strengthening them. And of course, this idea that scientists had artistic hobbies or avocations is certainly not an isolated one. Uh, Einstein played the violin, Max Planck played the piano, Maria Marian and Richard Feynman were avid painters and artists, and of course many more examples exist. Long before C.P. Snow and the two cultures debate between art and science that had such an impact on our educational system, G.H. Hoff won the first Nobel Prize in chemistry. He was a poet, and during his career in 1878 he said that scientific imagination is correlated with creative activities outside of science. A recent scientific article gives some credence to this idea, entitled Arts Foster Scientific Success. 
The paper looked at successful scientists, scientists that had won Nobel Prizes or belonged to prestigious institutions such as the National Academy in America or the Royal Society in Britain, and compared them to the less, their less successful counterparts in the general public. And the paper found that successful scientists were more likely to be polymaths. Polymaths here is a word used to describe an individual whose field of expertise spans across more than one discipline. So the paper found not only were successful scientists more likely to be polymaths, they were also more likely to experience art, be it through literature, music, painting, arts and crafts, and so on. The data suggests that artistic avocations can provide insights into scientific work. And indeed, Einstein told a colleague of his, a musical teacher, Suzuki, that the theory of relativity occurred to me by intuition, and music is a driving force behind this intuition. My parents had me study the violin by the time I was six. My new discovery is the result of musical perception. Now, we don't know Einstein. He's not famous for his violin playing. But by his own admission, it seems that he was able to integrate his musical experience into his scientific work as a physicist. Of course, one of the problems we have here is trying to disentangle or disambiguate between a causal and a correlative relationship. What I mean by this is we could ask the question in a slightly different way. Do artistic outlets contribute to the cognitive bases uh, of, of scientists, or do they merely reflect them? So, so what I mean by this question is, do these artistic outlets contribute to the cognitive bases upon which creative science can be developed, or do they merely reflect the pre-existing mental strengths of the scientists themselves? Unfortunately, there's not enough data to disentangle such a complex relationship. I can only speculate that the answer must lie somewhere in the middle, that innate talents are further strengthened through the practice of artistic avocations, which in turn benefit scientific work and vice versa. I was fortunate enough to be part of a project here in Portugal that brought artists and scientists together. And one of its multitude of aims was to examine whether art could positively influence the scientists and their scientific work. This project was a co-creation between Patricia Cucheia, Ana Rita Fonseca, and myself. And because the three of us believe that artists and scientists are driven by this innate curiosity to explore, we called the project Roots of Curiosity. And we challenged artists and scientists to come together and to create an object that was simultaneously artistic and scientific, to flirt in a third space between the disciplines. Because I believe that art and science are not that fundamentally different. Both seek to explore, each with their own unique set of tools and concepts, the unknown. And from the perspective of the brain, art and science are the tangible manifestations, be it an equation or a painting, of the mental representations we build of the world and in the world. So five artists and five neuroscientists worked together very intensely for a period of eight months. And there were many outcomes to this project. There was a run of performances. There were workshops for schools and the general public. There was a large conference. And there was a book and a documentary about the process in the residencies. As you can imagine, artists and scientists working together so intensely created many aha, eureka moments and also many frustrating ones. Objects were created, manipulated, destroyed, recreated, manipulated, destroyed, recreated, destroyed, created, and so on. Within the context of this talk, I'd like to focus on what the experience was for some of the scientists involved. So Alex, who quantifies movement and worked with a dancer for over eight months, was asked if the project changed the way he thought about science. In which case he replied, not the way I think about science, but the way I do science. According to my standards, I'm not only a better scientist, but also a more complete human being. Art, in particular working with a dancer, has taught me I can dare ask myself and answer myself the questions I pose to a rat or fly in the lab. Anna, who studies fear conditioning in the mammalian brain, was asked a similar question, and she replied, we create environments for the animals to do what we expect it to do and what we want to study. And if it doesn't do it, if it behaves in a different way, we assume we failed, and we rebuild the task. Most of the time, we don't care about this misbehaving. These discussions force me to be taken outside the behavioral box that is my work and look at it from the outside. Both scientists seem to have gained insights by focusing on the experience of their experimental subjects rather than on the experience of themselves as experimenters. So hopefully I've been able to give you a little bit of a glimpse into a project that occurred here in Portugal that brought artists and scientists together and that was very nourishing for the scientists involved. Because I think intuitively we know of the limitations of science. 
Eric Kandel, a Nobel Prize laureate and a neuroscientist, said in a recent book that while brain science can tell us the neural signs of a depression, a Beethoven symphony can show us what that depression feels like. Both perspectives are required if we are fully to grasp the nature of mind. And I believe that we could have not only better scientists, but more complete human beings if the arts and the humanities could be more integrated within the sciences. And indeed, that was one of the biggest drawbacks of the Roots of Curiosity project that I just described, which was because the scientists involved couldn't integrate their experience directly into their PhD thesis, the project had to be seen as something that was extracurricular, something they did when they left the laboratory. But in a modern context where uh, postdoc and faculty positions are so hard to procure, surely PhDs should be seen as diverse training grounds rather than fields of hyper-specialization. Projects such as these could form an integral part of the education uh, a graduate student receives. So on a TEDx whose theme is knowledge, and within a society where science's authority often seems unquestionable, I'd like to make the often forgotten point that knowledge is multidimensional, contains both implicit and explicit components, some of which are quantifiable and some of which are not. And it's easier, dare I say safer, for our educational system to focus on explicit knowledge. It gives us clear answers within a communal methodology. But other forms of knowledge, such as those generated through the artistic experience or, or the creative process in general, need to be inherently valued as deeply implicit forms of knowledge that are simply not reducible to their separate components. For example, intuition, so central to the artistic process and an important component of scientific discovery, is almost impossible to pin down empirically and often demands the antithesis to our modern day society, which is an ability to decelerate, to simply slow down so that observation can be decoupled from function. And by applying the same criteria of evaluation to both these implicit and explicit forms of knowledge in our educational system, we are strengthening one and devaluing the other. I'd like to finish with a quote by Karl Popper, of course, an avid defender of critical rationalism in science. He said that it is imperative that we give up the idea of ultimate sources of knowledge and admit that all knowledge is human, that it is mixed with our errors, our prejudices, our dreams and our hopes, and that all we can do is to grope for truth, even though it is beyond our reach. It can seem like a paradox. Knowledge often begins intuitively, just beyond our reach. And this can make us uncomfortable. There's a great deal of safety in knowing. But if we value only that which is explicit and quantifiable, we lose our capacity to play with the unknown. And it's this capacity to play with the unknown, this desire to explore the world around us, that I believe makes us truly human. Thank you very much.